once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul, and laid my heart in love, and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our Answer by and by When you feel a little prayer will turn in And you know a little light is burning You will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right Sometimes my path seems clear Without a ray of cheer And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day sin may shine and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus paves the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our faintest cry, answer by and by, you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Wonderful to hear a men's quartet this morning. I love it. It is so good to see you all this morning. Let's stand and worship as we sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I also want to say hello to all of you who are watching online and on television. For those of you who are in the room, would you please give our online television audience a big hand? few announcements as we get started today. In two weeks, we'll begin a new sermon series entitled The Free Methodist Way. And this is a time for us uh, as a church to grow and understand our affiliation with the Free Methodist Church and what all of that means. There'll be a five-week series starting August the 7th. Uh, also, uh, you may not know this, but there are estimated around 330 or more individuals in Montgomery County who are homeless. Uh, many of those are chronically homeless, and our Fraser missions are asking you to reach out to those and minister to those with two opportunities starting on August 7th. First, uh, to help with those in our city who deal with food insecurity. If you would, please donate items to our emergency food bags, uh, and those items would be uh, things such as beef jerky sticks, peanut butter and crackers, fruit cups, granola bars, and the like. Um, that'll be the first Sunday of each month. That's a great way to give immediate relief to people. Also, we'll be collecting t-shirts, body wipes, and sandals for our homeless care ministry, uh, which will be distributed to local organizations, including the Montgomery Police Department. You can find out more information about that just by visiting our app. Uh, also, as uh, the summer comes to a close and we prepare to start the fall on August 17th, August 17th at 6 p.m., we're going to have a night of vision right here in this room where I'll be talking about where we are and where we're going as we go into this new year. And that'll also be a kickoff for our discipleship for adults, children, and students. We will provide supper that night. And we just uh, ask that you come and join for a time of fellowship, of worship, and encouragement. Nursery will also be available through age four. And again, for more information on that, please just see our app. Um, a few weeks ago, just a couple of weeks ago now, we were excited uh, to host our July Jam. Had many, many children and volunteers come out to make this just an amazing time. I ask you to turn your attention to the screen to see what went on that week. see Cammie and her team, just tell them thank you for all they do in raising up our children to love and know Jesus. All of the, what we do is possible because you're faithful giving week in and week out. Thank you so much for that. Giving is an act of our worship. You can give the boxes that are located in the back of the worship center or by texting the number you see on the screen. If you donate by check, would you please make that payable to Fraser Church? Also, if you're a Fraser member uh, and you wish to give to our Early Debt Retirement Fund above and beyond your regular giving, you can do so by designating that on your check or selecting Debt Retirement Fund in the Fraser app. Would you pray with me? And we'll continue in worship. Father, we thank you so much because you were so good. We thank you for your presence that's here with us on this day. We thank you for all the things that we have to rejoice in because we know all good things come from you. And this morning as we come, as we give back, as an act of our worship to you, you who have given so generously to us, we pray that you would bless and you would multiply and we would continue to be about the business of spreading your kingdom all over the world. Lord, we love you. We really do. And we pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 If you would, please stand as we continue in worship.
please remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together in this historic declaration of the gospel. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This field now ripen There's a work for all to do And hark the voice of God is calling To the harvest call Does the place that you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if our God is in it, for He will not.
All right. Wow, that's a challenge for all of us to go in Jesus' name and realizing no matter what we do, little is much when God is in it. And one of those things that we all can do is we can pray. Sometimes it feels like, you know, what difference am I making if I lift up this little prayer for somebody or for something? Oh, big difference. Again, little is much when God is in it. So we want to spend some time in prayer today. We want to remember that as a church, we reach way beyond the walls of this building. We are all over the world today. We want to lift up two um, of our missions that we support that are in Africa, a different part of the world. First, for Fred's kids, uh, they are in Magori, Kenya. And uh, this ministry, they're seeking to be the hands and feet of Jesus supporting orphans and widows, not just there, but also around the world. Um, they provide support to plant churches. Um, to support evangelistic teams and also to help people in need right there in Kenya. So let's keep Fred's kids and that ministry that started in 2014, keep them in our prayers. Also, we want to lift up Wesley College, which is in Tanzania. And Eric Sword has stayed with us a couple times. He's active in that ministry. Uh, they are seeking to educate the next generation, this generation that is coming up as servant leaders there in Tanzania. Uh, many of these students come from impoverished, vulnerable populations, and at this college they can find skills, have a vision, and confidence in their faith, in God, in the gifts that they have to do His work and to be a light for Christ in the world. So remember um, Wesley College, remember Fred's kids in your prayer. Uh, we also want to lift up um, some celebrations of life this week. We want to remember um, Peggy Foles, who's the mother of Donna Hankins, went to be with the Lord. Judy Glanzer, member here, went to be with the Lord. And also remember Cam Hardigree and his family and the passing of his mother. Also encourage you to remember, right now we have a team uh, on the way to Cuba um, that is going to be doing mission work, and our youth are going to be having uh, their mission work going on at the end of this week. So keep that all in your prayers. And let's pray together. We'll close together in our Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, we rejoice in this day. Thank you for blue sky and for sun. Thank you for the warmth of summer. Thank you for the rains uh, that you've sent. But we thank you, oh God, for your love this day. For you are present here with us and you've loved us so much that you came in your son, Jesus Christ. And he died for our sins upon that cross. You loved us so much that you gave your only son. And now, O oh Lord, we receive that love. And, and you've told us not only are we to receive that love, but we are to share that love, to, to learn how to love you with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and to learn how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, there are so many of our neighbors that are hurting. Indeed, right here in this room, I know, Lord, uh, there are many hurting and going through difficult times. So help us to reach out with your love, with your grace. Um, help us to be your hands and your feet in this world. Lord, we're praying for uh, these two missions that we support in Africa, uh, for Fred's kids and for Wesley College, Lord. Bless them today. Bless them in their work. Bless them in their ministry. Encourage them. I know, Lord, they have challenges, but Lord, you just help them and walk with them right now. May they feel your hand and your love. We're praying for our mission team going to Cuba. Right now, they may be in the air or at the airport heading there to share your love and your grace to teach, to preach, and to learn, to share with kids. Lord, bless them in that ministry, and may they be blessed and bring that joy back here with them. We pray for our youth this week and for Mission Montgomery that they're going to be out and about and, and, and ministering to people again, being your hands and feet and sharing your love. Bless them, Lord, and use them in wonderful ways and help us, Lord, to catch on to that, that joy of their sharing and their ministry. Lord, bless us as your church, as your body. Bless Chris as he brings your word today. We thank you, God. You have blessed us in so many ways. Help us to continue, continue to reach out so that others might come to know you, so that people might grow as your followers, as your disciples. Lord, be with those hurting today. We pray for our sick. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those, Lord, who are facing surgeries or recovering from surgeries, those that are shut in in our nursing homes, assisted living. Pray for those, Lord, battling cancers. Whatever it is, Lord, right now we're asking for your hand to reach down, to bless them, to encourage them, to strengthen them. 
And again, God, use us as instruments of your love and your grace. All these things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, will you please stand for the reading of God's word. All right. Good morning. Um, today's reading will become, today's reading comes from Matthew 5th chapter, the 17th through the 20th verse. And it reads as follows. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an idol, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, good morning. If you have a Bible, please turn to Leviticus chapter 23, and you may want to keep that Bible out because we're going to be in a lot of different places this morning. Um, As you turn there, I want to uh, once again remind you of uh, the structure of the book of Leviticus. If you just start at the beginning and just try to read through like you would a novel, you're going to be confused. Uh, But chapters 1 through 7 start with the ritual sacrifices. Then if you go all the way to the end, chapters 23 through 27 talk about the ritual calendar. And since this is a chiastic structure, if you come in a layer, chapters 8 through 10 talk about the ordination of the priest, where chapters 21 and 22 talk about the qualifications of a priest. If you come in another layer, chapters 11 through 15 talk about the ritual purity. That's what we talked about last week. And chapters 18 through 20 talk about moral purity. And then right at the very center of the book, Leviticus 16 and 17, talks about the Day of Atonement, which we'll be talking about next week. Uh, For today, I want us to go to that last section, the ritual calendar, and and we're mainly going to be in chapter 23. And here's how I want to start that by reminding us that every one of us have rituals that we follow. Every one of us do. Even the most, uh, you know, spontaneous person among us has rituals that they follow. Uh, Many times we call them routines or we call them habits, uh, but at its core, that's what it is. It is a ritual that helps us function and go throughout our day. Uh, Many of us have morning routines or rituals that we go through. We get up, we get a cup of coffee, we do our devotion. If you're really, really uh, saint-like or you turn on the news if you just want to get mad, but we have, you know, morning uh, rituals that we go through. It, whenever you make it to work, there are certain things you like to do first to, you know, get everything in order for the work day. Or maybe in the afternoon, uh, whenever you get home, there's certain things you like to do as soon as you get home to, you know, feel like the afternoon is set and in order. Or before you go to bed, for example, it could be uh, a time where you have a certain ritual or routine that you like to engage in. Many times our kids or grandchildren uh, actually set the rituals that we go through in life and that we move through. And all of this is just a part of life. Again, we call them routines or habits, whatever it may be. I like the word rhythms. We have rhythms that we go through in life. And there are things, again, that help us function, that help us feel like we're settled and centered in life. And we set those, and we get to choose what they are. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been meditating really on two verses of Scripture in the New Testament book of Jude. You know, Jude does not have chapters. It just has verses. It's just 25 verses long. And I've been reading and rereading Jude verses 3 and 4. They say this. Jude writes and says, Beloved, 
Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. That famous verse there is verse 3 of that our job in our generation is to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And why is he telling them they need to contend? Verse 4 says, For certain people have crept in, that's into the church, unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God. They take the grace of God, pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, feelings, passions, pleasures, what makes me feel good, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And Jude says that there are people who come into the church, both in the first century, it happens today, we take the grace of God and we change it into what makes me feel good. Therefore, many times we build a whole theology around it, you know, what makes me feel good, therefore, it must be God. If it is something that makes me feel good or feel good about myself or feel good about life, it must be God. And we have to be very careful as we're going throughout life because our feelings drive us so much and we do want things such as pleasure in life and we want things to make us feel good, but we have to be careful when it comes to letting our feelings drive us. And what God does is he gives us rhythms or festivals or rituals, whatever you want to call them. He gives us rhythms to keep our feelings in check. The whole point of the feast of Israel in the Old Testament, one of the main points was to keep the people's feelings in check So, because we know that feelings that are not filtered through a healthy, godly rhythm get out of control, don't they? Too much of a good thing or too much indulgence in a bad thing. And we see this all the time in life. We all know what this feels like. and We've all experienced it in different ways. But the truth is we have rhythms in life that God has established. And what those rhythms do is they call us back. They bring our feelings in check. Because we even say things like, I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like reading. And the discipline part of that brings us, it puts our feelings in check so that we engage in the rhythm and that rhythm molds us. That's why we have phrases such as spiritual formation or we have phrases such as discipline. Being disciplined to do these things implies that I don't feel like doing them, but I'm going to be disciplined because this is a rhythm that is a part of my life. And what we see is that the rhythms shape us. The rhythms that we engage in shape us. And so it's very important that we shape our rhythms. And we make sure that they're in alignment with God's rhythms for his people. We as the modern church have to be very careful that, and I'm going to say something, you're going to go, what? We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful that we do not overemphasize individual relationship with God over and above our corporate rhythms that God has provided. Now, while we all believe that you have to have an individual personal relationship with God, what we do in our modern world many times is we just say, well, my relationship with God is private. It's just my business. And, you know, I just go about my spirituality however I want to. And what God has established is the holy assembly that we've already talked about. And we engage in corporate rhythms. And those rhythms shape us and mold us over time. And so when we come to the feast days of Israel or the festivals or the fast that they engage, engage in. These are moments where three important things are happening for the people. First of all, what is happening in these feast days and these godly rhythms that he has given is that the people, uh, they connect back to the Genesis and Exodus story, meaning these rhythms are rhythms to help the people remember. They're rhythms to remember. So many times we forget where we've come from. We forget our story. We're seeing that happening in America today. When we forget where we've been and what God has brought us through. And when we forget where we've been and what God has brought us through, we repeat history. And so the rhythms of Israel would point back and it would be a way for them to remember. Number two, the rhythms were a way that parents and grandparents taught their children and grandchildren. So these were rhythms Uh, that were used as a teaching tool in the moment to teach the coming generations over, uh, over time what God has done for them and how God has brought them through many different things. And then number three, the rhythms point forward to their ultimate fulfillment in Christ, meaning their rhythms of anticipation, rhythms of anticipation. 
And what we see take place in these feast days, these rhythms that God has given the people, is that there are rhythms to remember, there are rhythms that are used as a teaching tool in the present, but there are also rhythms for the future and anticipation. And so the people, when they would come and they would engage in these holy days, they lived in this past, present, future reality all in the moment. All in the moment. And that is the reality of worship. Because in worship, we learn from the past, right? And we hope from the future. I didn't say hope for, hope from the future. We bring those into the present, and that's where we are taught. That's where we are shaped. That's where we are molded into the image of Christ. And so that past, present, future reality is at play in worship. And again, that's why we have to be careful in worship that we, that we understand that worship is not just about me and my Jesus, What Jesus is doing in your life right now is a beautiful work of sanctification, and it is a byproduct of worship, but worship happens when the people gather to exalt God, where you're learning from the past, we are hoping from the future, and in that moment, we are molded and shaped into the image of Christ. Therefore, we are edified and encouraged. Now, if we go to Leviticus 23, we see that the foundational rhythm that is established for the people of Israel, we see it in verse 3, is the Sabbath. And I call this the foundational rhythm for uh, Israel because of its frequency. It happens every seven days. We see it, it's just in, it's a few sentences in verse 3, Leviticus 23 verse 3 says, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. And again, we all know this one on the seventh day, the people would not work. And again, later throughout history, even in Jesus' day, people came up with all kinds of rules of things you could and could not do on the Sabbath. It was never meant to be that legalistic. It was a day of rest. And it pointed back to the creation story, how that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day, God rested. And the people then were following God's example in doing that. And they were resting on the seventh day. But ultimately, too, it pointed forward to Jesus. And Jesus is our Sabbath's rest. It was Jesus who came and said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. It was Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29, who said, come to me. Come to me. I will give you rest. And if you want to do further study on how Jesus is, is our Sabbath's rest, just go to Hebrews chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5, particularly chapter 4. And you see that there very clearly, that Jesus is the place in which we find rest. So while this foundational day, yes, pointed back to the creation story, it also pointed forward to the day when the Messiah would come and rest could be had for all who would accept it. And then we see, uh, we get into the feast that we traditionally know as the Feast of Israel, and it starts with the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread. I'll talk about them separately, uh, but together, they are together in the text in verses 4 through 8. And again, on the Passover, this was the day in which there would be no work, and this pointed the people back to Exodus chapter 12. And if you have your Bibles, please turn there, Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1, this is right before the Lord is about to deliver the people out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, out of captivity, and it says to them, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, he says, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if a household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. And you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. 
And so the feast that God is giving them and reminding them of really in Leviticus chapter 23 goes all the way back to Exodus 12. He says, I want every single generation to do this. If you go over into Exodus 12, verses 14 through 17, he even names it and gives it the feast of unleavened bread, not just Passover, but also of unleavened bread. And whenever the people of Israel would gather for this feast every year, they were looking back at that Exodus story, remembering that moment, remembering that time when God had delivered them as a people. But also when they gathered, they pointed forward. They looked forward to that time when the Messiah would come. It was Jesus who showed up on the scene. And again, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That sounds like a very odd statement. But if you understand the context of the Exodus story, you know that Jesus truly is the Passover Lamb. Scripture is very clear about that. We'll see that in just a moment. But also, we have to understand that Jesus, yes, he is our Lamb. And what he is doing in that moment, 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn there, if you don't like to keep up or Google it, that's okay too. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, he, God, made him Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What we see in Jesus being the Lamb of God is he was able to accomplish something that an ordinary lamb never was able to accomplish when it just atoned for the sins or covered the people as they remembered God passing over them just once a year. But what we see is that Jesus is our lamb, and ultimately this festival is pointing toward that. Not only that, it was Jesus' blood who was spilled in our place. We see that in 1 Peter 1, 19. And with the Passover, we see the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so the uh, Feast of Passover is celebrated on one day, and then for the next seven days after that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And there is, no, and there is worship on the seventh day, after that time. And again, this is pointing back to the Exodus story in Exodus chapter 12. But also again, this is pointing forward. This idea of unleavened bread is pointing forward to Jesus who came and claimed, I am the bread of life. It was, Jesus said that in John 6, 35. Not only that, when Jesus is sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper, we see in Mark 14, 22, Jesus is sitting there and he takes bread and he breaks it. He says, this is my body broken for you. And for many, for the forgiveness of sins. We see that Jesus is the lamb who was slain. His blood was shed for us, but his body was also broken. He was the unleavened bread on our behalf. And you say, what is the deal with leaven? It's a very good question. Leaven represented corruption. It represented corruption among the people. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5... 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see that Paul is pulling on this understanding as he's talking about morality in the church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see in verse 6, says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Here he's using a metaphor. He says, Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Guess what? You get to go home today and tell everybody the preacher said, I am a new lump. <laughs> Congratulations. That you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Do you see that? See the connection? Our Passover lamb, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And again, here Paul is pulling on this and showing that because Jesus, our Passover lamb, has now been sacrificed once and for all, now sin does not have to reign, corruption does not have to reign, fallenness does not have to reign in our bodies. It does not. It no longer has dominion over us. And so we see the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. The next one is the feast of first fruits. This happened during the week of unleavened bread. And this was a time for the people to show gratitude. They would acknowledge God's provision by giving him the first fruits of their income or their harvest that they would bring. And they would wave a bundle before the Lord as an outward expression of an inward gratitude that they have. And in this festival, this feast, this rhythm of first fruits, the people were looking back that even though they had gone through hard times, tough times uh, on their journey, and, in, and they're still there on their journey to the promised land, even though that had been the case, God had faithfully provided every single time. Again, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 
he picks up on this theme of first fruits and he points forward and says that Christ is our first fruit offering unto God. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. And many times, I remember as a young man, I would read that and I'd say, Christ is the first fruit? What in the world does that mean? But you got to understand it in its context about this feast day, this rhythm that God wanted them to establish when they would thank God for his provision. And now Christ, the Messiah, has been provided for each and every one of us. And he is the first fruit offering because of his resurrection from the dead. And Jesus offered himself unto God as the first fruit offering so that we could do the same. The next festival or feast or rhythm that we see is the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. It's also known as Pentecost. And you may say, how do we go from weeks to Pentecost? Well, the Hebrew word for seven is weeks, but Pentecost is the Greek word for 50. And we see the Hebrew word used, the Hebrew word for seven, is because this feast was held seven Sabbaths after Passover plus one day. So seven times seven is 49 plus one day is 50. So in Hebrew, it's seven Sabbaths after Passover, the Greek word Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost was thanking God and worshiping God, but a very interesting thing would happen here. They were thanking God for their harvest, but they would share some of their crops with the poor. If you look in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, it says this. It says, and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. Notice that. Nor shall you gather the gleaning after the harvest, meaning don't go back through it again and get everything out of it. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And so right here we see in this feast, this festival, whenever they would go and they would gather uh, all their crops, they were to leave some for the poor and for those who were traveling. And as the people would do this, they would look back and they would remember the time when they were poor and in need and God again was there to provide. And this was an act of generosity for the people around them where the Feast of First Fruits was an act of generosity or thankfulness to God for His generosity to them, giving back the First Fruits. The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost was an act of generosity to the people who were around them. And then also later throughout history, we see that the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost was a time when the people of Israel, um, they thanked. God for receiving the law again something that they desperately needed they were poor in spirit if you will and God gave them instructions giving the law on Sinai but ultimately Pentecost 2 pointed forward to when God gave us something that we could not produce on our own it was God who gave us something in Acts chapter 2 at the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, that we could not produce on our own, just like the poor. They could not produce their own crops, and so they were dependent on other people and their generosity to give to them. We too found ourselves poor and in need. And in Acts chapter 2, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. Again, something we cannot produce on our own. That's why Jesus showed up in the famous sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter uh, chapter 5, verse 3. He, He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You say, how does that work out? He's acknowledging that we are poor in spirit. We need another spirit that we cannot produce on our own. And then in Romans 8, 14, Paul writes and says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We know that we are a true child of God when the spirit comes to rest in us. Again, Romans 8, and we cry out, Abba, Father. And Jesus says, yes, you are poor in spirit. There is a spirit that you need that you do not have that you cannot produce on your own. And so while the people celebrated what God had done and how God had provided to them, and they were generous to those who were around them in that moment during this feast, during this rhythm, it pointed forward to Pentecost when we who are poor in spirit will receive the spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead. The next feast that we see coming some months later was the Feast of Trumpets. This happened on the first day of the seventh month. You see there are a lot of sevens. There's a rhythm here that the people are living in. On the first day of the seventh month, they would celebrate with the Feast of Trumpets. They're celebrating the end of the harvest. In the post-exilic time, this became known as the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. 
And at this time, they would look back and they would celebrate how that God, with the blast, spoke the world into existence. But sin had entered the world, and so atonement was needed. And the trumpet blast would announce that atonement is coming in the Day of Atonement that would be just a few days later. But if you look forward, what we see here is that this Feast of Trumpets, while it pointed back to God again creating the world and sin entering the world and the need for atonement, it also pointed forward to the fact that one day Christ would return. Again, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50, it says, Paul writes and says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. You hear that? One day the last trumpet will sound. He says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And so as the people would gather and the trumpet would blast, announcing that the day of atonement was coming, Paul is saying one day the last trumpet will sound and Christ will return at that moment in that announcement. The trumpet sound was a witness to the nations that atonement was possible and atonement was available to the people. But again, looking forward, when the trumpet sounds again, that's when Philippians 2, 10 and 11 will become a reality and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then we see, after the feast of the trumpets, we see the day of atonement. We're going to talk more about this at length next week. But it was on the 10th day of the seventh month. And this was a day of fasting, not feasting. And as the people looked back, they saw the reality, their reality, the reality of their own sin and mortality and their need for atonement, their need for the relationship with God that had been broken to be restored. But it also pointed forward to what Christ would do for us. If we go over to Romans chapter, hold your place in 1 Corinthians 15. If you go to Romans chapter 6, real quickly. Boy, I hear a lot of pages turning. This is a Bible. You can bring it to church if you want to. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him, that is Christ, here he's talking in the context of baptism, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Verse 7, for, w- for one has died, and has, uh, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, we will, uh, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Here's verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Right there, Paul is telling us that is our reality now because of the atonement of Christ. That when we are buried with him in baptism, again, that is the context. When we have died to ourselves, we are raised with him to new life. And that's how we live right here, right now. But there's also coming a day, a future reality, when the day of atonement will reach its crescendo in all of human history. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Pick it back up in verse 53. It says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Verse 54 When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, quoting the Old Testament, death has been swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. While the people would gather and have the day of atonement, yes, they were looking back to the reality of their own sin and they were fasting their own uh, fasting and understanding their own mortality, but they were pointing forward to the day when Christ would come 
And our current reality is we are dead to sin. We are alive in Him if we truly are in Him. But there's coming a day when Jesus' victory will be our victory. And again, atonement will reach its crescendo and its final execution on us. And then we get the Feast of Tabernacles or booths. Fifteenth day of the seventh month, just a few days later. This is when the people would gather and they would remember the 40-year journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. But ultimately, this day pointed forward to the day whenever our journey would end. A day when we would be with the Lord forever, when we would be with Jesus forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 16. It says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. This is all happening in this moment. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We will always be with the Lord in that moment, on that day. And what we see is that there's coming a day while the people pointed back to the Feast of Tabernacles or booths where they would put booths out and remember that journey, that 40-year journey. There's coming a day when we will forever tabernacle with the Lord. I want you to see that these feasts, these festivals, they're all pointing us to Christ. It starts with that foundational time, the Sabbath, We see that day of rest, that Jesus is our ultimate rest, but how do we have that rest? How can we obtain a rest like that, an eternal rest in Christ? It starts with Passover. Jesus is our lamb. His blood was shed for us. It's the feast of unleavened bread. Jesus is the bread of life. His body was broken for us. It is the feast of first fruits. Jesus, by his resurrection, was the first fruit offering to God for us. It is the feast of Pentecost. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to us right here, right now. But one day, it is the feast of trumpets. Jesus will return. And on that day, Jesus' victory will be our victory, day of atonement. And on that day, We will tabernacle with Jesus forever. And so, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus shows up one day and says these words. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Because all is pointing to Him. And what Jesus is saying in this moment is all that you see in the law and the prophets. It's going to be accomplished. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to accomplish that on your behalf. The question is, do we see it? And in order to see it, we have to see Him. He showed up and said these words that many of us have read so many times. And He says, yes, It's all about me. I am the center and circumference of all that the law and prophets were talking about. It's all about me. And again, the question is, are we all about him? I pray it's so. Amen? Amen. Father, I pray today that we would see what Jesus has done and will do for us that everything will be accomplished according to your perfect plan. And Lord, I pray that we would trust as we see, may we trust. And may we hope from the future for that glorious day when we will be together, when we will tabernacle together forever. Lord, may these feasts, may these rhythms be embedded in our soul that we may see Jesus and just Jesus. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.
Church, would you stand with me in worship as we sing the first and last verses of When We All Get to Heaven. church. Well, you know, Genesis 1 tells us that the very sun, moon, and stars were set in place in order to mark these festivals that we've learned about today from Leviticus so that every cycle of our lives, our days, our months, the years that we live would all point us towards Jesus and towards a life filled with him and pointed towards that day when we see him face to face. And so just want to challenge you today, if you haven't yet connected with Jesus Christ, then really you're just going around in circles and you don't know why. But if you understand today that he's put every cycle in nature and in your own life to orient you towards Jesus and to give meaning and purpose as you look forward to seeing him face to face, then you can come to him today. You can begin that relationship with him through a prayer something like this. Father, I thank you for creating all things so that I could know you and be your child. And I confess today that I'm a sinner and I've turned away from you and I've rebelled and I've followed my own feelings and passions instead of the rhythms you put in place for me. But right now, I believe that you gave Jesus your son to die on a cross for me to forgive me of my sins and to set me free from the power of sin and death. And you raised him from the dead to give me a new and eternal life with you forever. And so, Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and Lord, and I ask you to give me now what I cannot get for myself. Give me your Holy Spirit power to walk with you all the days and months and years and seasons of my life until I see you face to face, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you today, I'd love to talk with you after the service, or if you're watching online, text the number that you'll see on the screens. and just want to Remind you that you have connection cards in front of you. Maybe there's a next step in your own walk with the Lord that the Spirit has put on your heart and you want to uh, respond in that way. Also, we'll have prayer volunteers over by the stained glass windows that would love to pray with you about any decision that's on your heart or just a burden that you have today. So why don't we stand together and receive a blessing as we go out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face towards you. May he make his face shine upon you. May you know that he is with you in the morning and in the evening, through the years and the seasons of life. And may you go from this place focused on Jesus Christ as the purpose of each and everything. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace.